Hey guys, it's Chilier. Welcome back to Hardware 3D. Continuing on with Dynamic Shadows. In this video, we are going to implement PCF with special accelerated hardware using comparison sampler settings. Uh, we're going to fix a funky bug in our shadow code. And did you notice it in the last video? Because it was in there. Uh, we're going to discuss the idea of soft shadows, area light, and the penumbra. And we're going to talk about the theory of slope-scaled depth biasing. Let's jump right into it. Let's take a look at how we're currently sampling with our PCF. So if this is the actual point that should be sampled based on, you know, our mapping, what we're going to do is we're going to sample, you know, basically 0 0.5 in the direction of the four corners here. So we're actually going to read these four texels perform four independent uh, depth comparisons and get a uh, value that ranges between 0 and 1. This is actually very similar to what the hardware does when it does bilinear filtering, right? If we were to sample here, it would actually load four texels and then it would blend them together based on, you know, the, uh, the, the closeness of the actual point of sampling to each one of these. So this point of sampling is most close to the center of this texel. So this texel would contribute the most, then these two, and this one would contribute the least in bilinear filtering. Now it turns out that we can actually use these same parts of the hardware in our shadow sampling. We've got to use some specialized features of the sampler, but it works out well. We can tell the hardware, well, uh, we want you to fetch the four neighboring texels, but now instead of just blending their values, we actually want you to compare the values to some reference uh, depth Z, and based on that comparison, they're either going to you know be on or off, and then we can have our sampler do bilinear filtering between those results, and what that means is instead of you know having four levels of color. Wait, did I say four levels? I meant five levels, right? Because you got zero to one, and then you got 0 0.25, 0 0.5, 0 0.75, right? So you actually get five levels with this. Pardon my French, I was misspeaking up until now. Um, instead of that, you blur so you get a continuous range of values, right? So if this one is on, and this is on and on and off, you're going to take a bigger proportion of this one because it's closer to the point of sampling, smaller proportion of this one, and the off is going to contribute the least. So you're, if you do bilinear filtering with this hardware comparison, you're not going to get a value out of 0.75, you're going to get a value out, you know, maybe closer to 0.9 or 0.85 or something like that. And so if the point of sampling was slightly closer here, it would be closer to 0.75. So now, as your point of sampling moves in small amounts across this texel, you get a gradation of results. You need to get a smooth blending. And that's going to look very nice. So how do we accomplish this witchcraft? Well, hardware PCF. What are we going to do? First of all, we got to change our sampler. We now have to use the comparison functionality of the sampler. So our filter instead of being a linear filter, we are going to be a filter comparison and we're going to do the comparison and then we're going to linearly filter the results. And if you're using a comparison filter, you have to supply a comparison function. So we want less than or equal. Basically, if the value that we pass in is less than or equal to the value that is sampled from the texture, the depth value, then it should be lit. Otherwise, it should not be lit. And then in our uh, our shadowing function here, we have to change the the sampler object that we have. If we create a sampler with a filter type of filter comparison in the uh, the CPU side, in the shader, we have to make it a sampler comparison state, not a sampler state. That's an, one important distinction. Second very important distinction is now our sampling function isn't sample; it's sample compare. And we want to do the comparison at the MIP level 0. So we do sample compare level 0. We pass in the sampler object, the UV coordinates to sample from, the comparison value, and then we can also pass in an offset. And this is useful for, you know, doing a PCF filter where we're going to sample points around. Uh, now, 
in this code here, I've actually combined hardware uh, PCF with manually taking multiple samples. So we're doing hardware PCF and we're doing it many times to create an even smoother filter. But I don't want to jump right to that in our video here. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to reset to this point in the commit, but I'm going to edit the shader a little bit. So instead of um, doing this PCF range, we're just going to do a single call into compare sample level zero. So that means we don't need this offset here. We'll talk about that in a little bit. And we don't need this PCF range, but we'll leave it. So if we run this, we should still be, our sampling should still be gathering only four samples, but the comparison will happen in the hardware. And, very important thing, the results will be blended um, continuously instead of just having five levels of light. So here we are back in our scene, and here is the edge of our texture. And you can see, you can still identify the pixels from the shadow map that generate this shadow, but you can also see that the edges have become very fuzzy and blurry, and this is due to that continuous transition from zero to one. It's not just, you know, one level, or not just two levels, or five levels of shadowing, but a continuous range at the edge of the shadow. Now, if we combine this with taking a grid of samples, we combine those two techniques, we manually sample in a grid, plus each one of those samples has the hardware PCF and the bilinear filtering applied, we're going to get something that looks very nice. So the way that works again, it's very similar, um, we're still doing sample, compare level zero, passing in the same stuff, applying our shadow bias here. Uh, difference is, we are now doing a grid of samples. So PCF range 4, so that means X and Y are going to range from negative 4 to positive 4. Um, we're also going to go in steps of 2, so 2 texels. So we're going to go negative 4, negative 2, 0, positive 2, positive 4. That's 5 steps in the X, 5 steps in the Y, that's 25 samples we're taking. And because we're doing steps of 2, the samples are going to be fairly far apart. Now this code is obviously broken, it doesn't work. Uh, let me, <laughs> can you see the issue in the code? Now, I think it should be fairly obvious um, that the code is going to have self-shadowing problems. And here we can see we've got serious shadow acne going on the floor here. And I mean, the reason for that, think about how far away from the actual point we're now sampling in the shadow map. We're sampling four texels away. That's not a good thing. So obviously for our slope mediated self-shadowing, it's going to be a huge issue, but forget about that. Let's just take a look at the result we get on the wall. Uh, now we're taking 25 samples, we should see a really much better result, and it looks the same as if we just took one sample. So obviously, you know, shit's, shit's messed up. Shit is hecked up, as we like to say. It's hecked up, bud. Now, the result, the reason for that here should be obvious, uh, but it might not be obvious just watching a video, obviously. I'm using the word obvious a little too much here. It's a little weird. I'm going to keep doing it. So obviously what we want to do is uh, if we're taking 25 samples, we want to sum up, we want to add all those values together and then divide by 25 so that we get a result between 0 and 1. Here, we're taking those 25 samples, but we're just overwriting the previous sample. So the only result that's actually used is the final sample. That's not, that's not good for anybody. Uh, so that's dumb. Hardware PCF multi-sample. I imagine we're going to fix some stuff in here. So we're going to take the PCF range, we're going to bring it down to 2. Not 4, just 2. But we're going to take the same amount of samples. So now our step is going to be, we're just going to step by 1. So the, the distance that we're sampling, the worst, the farthest distance from the actual point is smaller. So we're going to get less errors, but we're still taking the same amount of samples. That's good. All right. Next thing, uh, I also do a test to make sure that Z is uh, not less than zero. So if it is greater than one or less than zero, we're now going to say this is outside of our range and we're just going to return one. I don't know why I needed this, to be honest. You could, you could try to remove it with this code and see what, ch what it changes, but it's not a bad idea to make sure that Z is within the acceptable range. Uh, so we added that. 
And down here, now we are actually accumulating the results from our sampling. We're not just taking the last one and discarding the rest. And here, we are dividing by the total number of samples taken. So each one of these calls to sample compare will return, you know, a value between zero and one. So the maximum, uh, in this case, the maximum would will accumulate is 25. So then here, we're going to divide by 25 to get a end value between zero and one. And, you know, we just do a little math with PCF range so that if we change the range to be bigger or smaller, the division amount will automatically be changed to reflect that. That's always nice, right? And then we return that. So this is what we should have done to begin with. And we now see that that terrible shadow acne, self-shadowing stuff, has been eliminated, at least for this setup here. I'm sure we could make it come back with, you know, worse, um, worse slopes. But we're not going to do that. We are going to examine the result of our multi-sampling with hardware PCF by taking a close look up on our shadow. I mean, even from this distance, you can see it looks better. But let me just turn up the contrast a little bit. And now we're going to get in, we're going to get up, up in that butthole. And look at that. That is much nicer. That is a really good result. You got to say, okay, this is a pretty beautiful result here. So combining, taking multiple samples, sampling in a grid, with the hardware PCF, which gives us a nice continuous range, um, gives us these beautiful, these beautiful shadows. This is a very good thing. This is a very nice result here. One little thing I want to mention here is that this, uh, what is this, the fifth parameter, fourth parameter, fourth parameter here, this gives us an offset. So, you know, when we're doing our sampling in a grid, this allows us to offset from the, the center sampling position by, you know, for example, let's say three pixels to the left, maybe two pixels up or whatever. Now, the thing about this is it has to be, this parameter here has to be a constant known at compile time. So that means that if you're looping dynamically through these ranges uh, to generate X and Y, those dynamic values can't be used here, it won't work. Uh, so these these uh, loops, they can't be dynamic. They have to be unrolled. If you don't know what that means, it just means that instead of, you know, doing a loop in comparison at runtime, the compiler takes these loops and it unrolls them into just a sequence. Basically, it just unrolls it into a sequence of 25 calls into this, uh, 25 uh, instantiations of this line of code uh, with all the different, you know, appropriate X and Y for that point in the loop. So it's basically doing the loop at compile time, generating, and that gives us these X and Y at compile time, and that allows us to do this. And in, in fact, um, you don't actually necessarily need to specify unrolling, but if you don't specify it explicitly, you will get, it'll compile, but you'll get a warning, and it says here, texture access must have literal offset and multi-sample index, forcing loop to unroll. So it's just telling you that we had to unroll this loop. So it's nice. It's nicer to just you know explicitly do that, then you don't get this warning. Just a small little HLSL point here. So our hardware sampling with additional manual multi-sampling here, hardware PCF with additional manual multi-sampling, is looking very nice. But there's a problem, and this problem plagued me for a while when I was developing this. It took me a while to figure out what it was. So if you want a uh, if you want a little challenge you can try to figure it out for yourself um obviously i'm going to tell you right after this but first let me show you look at look at when we look at the the shadow here it doesn't look it doesn't look very good it doesn't look very filtered right it looks quite jaggy uh, what's what gives here it looks very nice very smooth very soft edges here what the hell is this? This is jagged as hell. You can cut your freaking, cut your dick on this, and it won't be a fun time. Uh, but here, it's all smooth out. What? What gives? It doesn't make any freaking sense. So I had myself. I'm not gonna lie. I had myself pulling my hair out. Look at here. It's all jaggy. Look at this direction. It's all smooth. What the heck? And the answer is, is I wasn't modulating the specular component by the shadow. So the specular was getting through either way, uh, unless the shadow was exactly zero, because if it's exactly zero, I have that if statement that short circuits the lighting calculation altogether. 
So, for the short circuit, you get the hard shadow. And then for the soft shadow, it's not modulating the specular. And so you can see where the specular that's not being modulated is butting up against the hard shadowing from the, from the short circuit. And that's not good. That's obviously not good. And the, so the solution is easy once you know the problem. But I was working with a bunch of you know, stuff I never worked with before, hardware PCF and stuff. I didn't know where the issue was. It took me a while to diagnose it. But once you've diagnosed the problem, it's often quite an easy cure. So fixing the PCF pixelated badness in two of these shaders, when I incorporated the shadowing code, I multiply the diffuse by the shadow level, but I neglected to multiply the specular by the shadow level, and that was causing the whole problem. Certainly doesn't help matters that I got it right on some shaders, so for some materials it looked fine, and only for other materials the, the problem manifested. Just fun bugs to try to di diagnose. But I got, uh, I think I deployed Shader Debugger in that situation as well. And it looked, it worked out okay in the end. So now we see here, no matter what direction I look at my shadows from, they're nice and smooth. Smooth like butter. Beautiful. Let's look at, let's look behind the curtain here. Ah, oh, yeah, that's what we like to see. All right. Beautiful stuff. This PCF is working. Fixed a problem with the specular. Life is grand. All right, so, when we are doing shadow of an object, I mean, in our system, all of our lights so far, point lights, right? They have they don't have dimensions, there's just an infinitesimal point of light in the universe. Um, so if we trace out how that should cast a shadow, we just got to draw a single line at the boundaries here. And we see, yeah, so this stuff here should be in shadow, and stuff outside should be lit, and it's, a, it's just a one-zero thing. But, in the real world, point lights don't exist. Things that have no dimension, that are a perfect mathematical point, they don't exist. Think about a light bulb. Light bulb, the thing that actually generates the light, is a filament, it is a wire, it has dimensions, it's pretty small, but it has dimensions. And it might be frosted, so in that case, the light sort of appears like it's coming out of the bulb itself. The surface of the bulb instead of the filament. So now our light emitter, it actually takes up space in the universe. It has dimensions. It's not just a single point emitting light. It is an infinite amount of points on this surface all emitting light. What does this mean? Well, the way that shadows are cast are actually a little bit different. So what we do to represent that geometrically, is we would go from the far end to the far end here. Cast one line like that. And then we'd go from the near end. We cast another straight line. And that'd be like that. And then we'd go from this end here. We cast another straight line like that. And then from this end here, we cast another straight line, like that. What does it mean? What does it all mean, Chili? Well, basically, if we take a point here, in this region, we can draw a line from this point here to any point uh, on the sphere here, basically. So it has line of sight to the entire light, fully lit. This one, fully lit. Okay. Cool. Cool, cool. What about a point here? Well, any point here, if we try to draw a line from this point to any point on the sphere, it's going to or to the light, it's going to intersect with the sphere. Totally in shadow. Cool, cool. What about this point here, in between the total light and total shadow region? Well, if we draw a line from here to this edge, ah, it can see this side of the light. But if we draw a line from here to this edge, we will note that passes through the sphere. So, this point here in this region gets light from some of the light source, but not all of it. So, it's partially in light, partially in shade. 
it's kind of like a partial eclipse. Uh, we call these regions here the penumbra, I think. Probably? I don't know. Anyways, what the, the ramifications of this is that light and shadow isn't just all light, all shadow, unless you have a perfect point light, which don't actually exist in reality. What you get is the edges are blended softly. Pretty cool, huh? So, hard shadows, not much of a thing that exists. Not perfectly hard shadows, anyways. Uh, the smaller your light source, obviously, the harder the shadow will be. The distance of the light source uh, and the object, and the distance of the object, the place where it's being cast, they all factor in to the amount of soft edges in the how big that region is in the shadow so what i'm trying to get at here is our system of blending the edges of the shadows our pcf actually gives us kind of fake soft shadows so it's actually giving us it's not only just fixing the pixelated edge issue which looks like garbage but it also gives us a simulation which is a little bit closer to life now it's not a very good simulation I'll give it that. Uh, the, the the size of the blurred region, the size of the uh, the soft shadow region, is dependent on the kernel, the PCF kernel. It has nothing to do with the apparent size of the light source or the the position of the object and the light relative to the uh, projection surface. So it's not a very good simulation, but it actually makes it more realistic than having none at all. So it's two, it's two birds with one stone, basically. You're getting two birds stoned at once, and that's always nice. All right, let's, uh, let's go back to the slope-mediated depth error phenomenon thing that uh, we introduced before, because there is something that we can definitely do here that is going to make our lives much better. So, um, looking at this bad boy here, we are generating our shadow map, and for this geometry, that is basically the surface flush towards the light. So we sample the depth at every point here, corresponding to points on our shadow map, and we find that the depth is the same. So there isn't going to be any error between, uh, like if you were to render from the point of view of the camera, and you know sample depth between these points here and then compare it, there's not going to be any error because there's no change in depth. There's no slope with respect to the uh, the light viewing position. All right. Now, take a look at this one. Now it is not flush. The surface isn't flush towards the camera. It's pointed at an angle. So we're capturing depths at these sampling points. And we can see here that there are going to be error depending on where you sample from your viewing position, there is going to be error with respect to what is stored in the depth buffer. And we can see that the more you tilt the surface, the bigger that error is going to be. So the error is dependent on the angle of the geometry to the light. And the error determines how much bias we need to apply so that we don't get our shit wrecked. Hmm. Here's the thing. We want to apply as little bias as possible. So for a surface like this, ideally, we need almost zero bias. Just a little bit of bias to get us over the hump of um, floating point error. That's all we need. Whereas here, we're going to need a decent amount of bias. And if our surface was like this, we're going to need a butt ton of bias. But if we add a butt ton of bias to handle this, it is going to mess up our shadow rendering in a whole bunch of different places. So what we would like to do is only apply the amount of bias necessary. We can do that. We can actually dynamically adjust the amount of bias that we apply depending on the angle of the geometry to the light. And we could do this in different places. We could do this uh, in the pixel shader when we're doing our actual scene render or we could do it in pixel shader uh, or not the pixel shader but in the vertex shader of the scene rendering we do them in the vertex shader of the shadow buffer rendering but we're not going to do any of those 
because the hardware actually has a fixed function to do that for us automatically. So there are two places where we can apply the bias, by the way. We can apply it to the depth as captured from the viewing position. We move it closer to the camera or to the light uh, to offset, to re reduce self-shadowing. But we can also do the opposite, right? We could take the values in the depth buffer and we could move them back. We could move them further away so that they're, they're definitely behind the position, the real position of the, uh, of the surface. So we can, you know, move this forward or we can move these guys back. And what we're going to do is we're going to move them back, but we're going to move them back while we're rendering and capturing the depth information. We're going to move them back a little bit. And the amount that we move them back will be dependent on the slope. So here, we're actually not going to move them back at all because there's no, there's no slope. But here, we're going to move them back quite a bit. And if it were here, we would have to move them back a butt ton from here to here, maybe. Get the idea? So, where is this fixed function? How do we access this amazing goodness? Well, for the answer to that question, you're going to have to stay tuned for the final video from this recording session. In that video, we're going to do slope-scaled depth biasing in hardware, which is going to give us the best of both worlds of having grid sampled PCF with both reduced Peter Panning and reduced self-shadowing. We'll also build a shadow sandbox system and allow us to change all the shadowing parameters and technique permutations at runtime so you can easily compare, contrast, and understand the effects of all the different settings that you can tweak and toggle. Finally, we'll do briefly an overview of some concepts and techniques that didn't quite make the cut for this tutorial arc, but that you should probably still be aware of. Until then, thanks for watching. Hope you enjoyed this video. If you did, please click the like button. It helps a lot. And I will see you soon with some more Hardware 3D.